Welcome, my name is Nicole Havlicek uh, with Primetime Pickleball. You're on the Primetime Pickleball YouTube channel right now. Um, uh, also, you can check out the website at primetimepickleball.com. Uh, today, I'm very excited to bring on two guests, uh, Drew Diefenbach, who's a pickleball coach, as well as a tournament director, and he's just all in on pickleball. Really good dude, really good players, put on a lot of tennis tournaments over the years, so very knowledgeable in the space of tournaments and coaching for sure. I also have uh, Dr. Michelle Clear with us. She is a uh, performance expert. So she, I know she works with athletes, musicians, I, I believe uh, business people as well. Anyone who's striving to be high performance in whatever endeavor it is that they have chosen. So I'm super pumped to have these two awesome guests on here and they're gonna share some insights with us about uh, mental performance and playing at your best and really getting the most out of yourself, especially when it counts. Uh, and so without any further ado, let me bring them on now. Welcome Michelle and Drew to the call. Thanks so, for having me. Absolutely, thanks for being here. And uh, you know, I just gave the this very smallest of introductions for you. Uh, so if you could, um, I'd love you to, since you know your background better than I do, I'd love uh, you guys to share, you know, a, a bit about your background, how you came to pickleball. <clears throat> just uh, you know, let us know about that. So why don't we start with uh, Dr. Michelle? All right. Thanks, Nicole, again for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so as you said, I'm a performance coach and I work with a lot of different performers at different levels, uh, in a lot of different areas, um, in a lot of different ages. So, uh, I work with a lot of people around helping them to align their head and their body so that the two can work together more efficiently because we practice to play pickleball and then we get into a tournament and what's the first thing that happens your head goes so it really is about aligning these two sort of systems and uh feeling like you have some control over those ups and downs and emotions that are happening before and during and after um you know, playing pickleball and, uh, you know, and again, other sports and other performers, but I've been doing this for 20 years and I love it. Um, I've worked with several pickleball players, professional, you know, all the way down. And it's a lot of fun helping people to um, be able to perform more optimally just with kind of like a small switch. So it's a, it's a great thing. And I love pickleball. I, uh, in my in my last video called myself a pickleball addict, uh, it's it's just a great thing. I think uh, I just think you know I've been an athlete all my life. I played four sports in high school and I've you know done triathlons and marathons and all kinds of things and played a little bit of tennis. But when pickleball came around and I started playing, it was uh, yeah, it was just amazing and I I can't get enough of it. So playing now, working on the mental side with athletes. Um, Drew and I are doing a camp together in August and uh, just, you know, really enjoying life. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, we're excited to to dive into, I love what you said there about the little switches that can make a huge difference. Cause like uh, people on are probably familiar with, with the content on my channel and I'm very skill focused, but one of the, like, none of that really matters like it's all very important but none of it matters unless you have like your mindset and your head right in order to be able to let that shine so this is really the foundation and that's why i'm super excited to have you guys on because i haven't done um much on this topic and i would love to do more so thanks for being here and let's uh rotate to uh drew drew tell us a little bit about yourself hey everybody my name is drew diefenbach nice to meet all of you uh, hopefully in person one day, but right now online. Um, yeah, so I grew up playing tennis my whole life. Started when I was five years old. I, I was a, a nationally ranked junior. I played collegiately. Um, and I've been, wor I've been running my own tennis business for the last eight years. Uh, I've, lit I've uh, worked in the tennis industry for the past 11 years. 
Um, in 2013, um, I started noticing pickleball lines on tennis courts and people said, this is pickleball. Like, what are those lines for? And they said, it's for pickleball. And I was like, okay, cool. That's weird. I have no idea what that's about, but, um, (laughs) I started, I, I, I ended up coaching pickleball, as Nicole said, um, and getting involved in it. Um, full time this year, uh, but I, I really started getting involved in it just a little bit about two and a half years ago. Um, um, I started exploring, you know, uh, pickleball and trying to figure out what was going on. And um, pre pandemic, it was starting to get popular around the Bay Area um, and, and nationally as well. It started to really take off. Um, and so I had to answer the question, what is pickleball, you know? Um, so it's been quite a journey, um, that's for sure. Um, last year, I started competing. Um, and yeah, I, I definitely realized that it's a different game. It's not tennis. It has a lot of similarities. Um, a lot of my strengths in tennis apply. A lot of my mental I guess strengths applied as well, but the nuances of the game started to bring up uh, different mental challenges and different uh, technical challenges that I had to figure out and try to overcome. Um, and me as a player today, that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I, I started off playing 4-0, um, and now I play in the 5-0 and uh, professional uh, divisions. I'm not to toot my own horn, but I've gotten a lot better. Um, I think I'm, uh, I'll just stop right there. <laughs> yeah, I can attest to Drew's a, a fabulous player. I've, I've seen him play and I know his tennis history and all those skills translate well. But of course, like you said, it's a different game. And he, just like anyone, had to learn to play pickleball, not bring tennis and try to play tennis on the pickleball court. So um, yeah, okay, so without further ado, I'd love to just, uh, thanks for that, Michelle and Drew, sharing that your backgrounds with us. I'd love to jump to the Q&A now. I did get a few questions in via email. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the perks of being on the Primetime Pickleball uh, newsletter is that I'm gonna uh, throw out the, the questions from, from my email subscribers first, but definitely while we're covering those, drop your questions in to the chat and we'll do our best to get through all of those. So if you have any questions about pickleball and more specifically about competing at your best when it matters, whether that be in like a duper match that you guys have set up and we'll talk maybe a little bit more about the duper rating system that's coming into the game, that's gonna be very helpful um, for pickleball later. Or if that's a tournament, um, if you're heading into tournament play and you're, you, if you're new to tournaments or you have played tournaments and maybe you struggle a bit with playing your best when it really matters and when the, the, the games are on the line. So like, cause you want to progress to those medal matches, obviously that's typically the goal for any tournament player. So let's uh, jump in to the first question. And as I said, um, whoever's on, please feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat. All right. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna start with Len's question. Um, it's a bit long, just give me a second. I seem to be able to perform quite well while drilling, hitting shots with confidence, executing what I see as an opportunity most of the time. Then we will play and the pressure ratchets ratchets up immediately and I definitely do not feel as loose and confidence, confident as when I was drilling. I really have to talk myself into settling down and visualizing the drilling session I just came out of. I was hoping, uh, okay, so can we speak to that? I'd love to speak to how we can maybe play Obviously this, I think this comes up a lot. It comes up for me, I'm sure it comes up for you guys too. Like we're just, we are just a little bit looser when we're drilling and the, and the match or the games, there's nothing super on the line. So how can we bridge that gap? And why don't we um, start with Michelle on that one? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and you know, actually that's where it all begins, right? Is before the match, how do you deal with the nerves and the pressure that, that comes up? Um, it's really difficult because as I said in my introduction, right? Like you're all ready to go. And then all of a sudden it's like, uh Oh, what is happening? Right? Like I just drilled and I practiced and I feel physically ready to go, but not mentally ready to go. Right. So it's almost like these two parts of our body are, you know, 
separated before we're going to go play an important match or a tournament. Um, so over my 20 years of doing this work, um, I have identified really important areas where athletes, pickleball players need to really develop these mental skills to be able to deal with critical moments. And one of those moments is really before you're going to go play a tournament is figuring out kind of what headspace you need to get into. We all warm up physically, but no one really warms up mentally until they know that this is something that they should be doing. So figuring out where you need to be before a tournament, do you need to be a little calm and relaxed or do you need to be a little bit pumped up? And then developing the skills to get yourself in that headspace is critically important. Uh, that gives you the best opportunity really to play sort of like you drill and like you practice. Uh, and, you know, it's not it's not rocket science necessarily, but, you know, one of the reasons I have a job is because I help people in a really like systematic way figure out what that looks like for them. Because, you know, we read books and, you know, we take a course and it says, do this, do that. And so as human beings, we try one thing and, you know, the next day we're like, no, that didn't work. Let me try something else. And all oh, that didn't work. Let me try this and that. So it's hard, I think, as human beings to figure out what's going to work for us. And again, you know, that's why uh, I have my job uh, and I love my work because I get to help people figure that out. Uh, where do you need to be and how do we get you there? What small things? And then really reinforce that stuff so that it becomes second nature. Uh, but yeah, you got to be able to understand that pressure in those nerves. And I tell all of my clients, you know, nerves probably are always going to exist, right? Like Nicole, you just said it, right? Like you have nerves. I have a little bit of nerves and uh, it may always exist, but the important thing to recognize is that those nerves are really just your body's reaction to something big and something important is going to happen. Right. And then we translate that into like, Oh my God, or okay, I'm excited or whatever. Right. So we have to figure out how to translate those nerves that we feel before a tournament in a productive, positive way so that they don't, you know, take over. And then we get on court and we're all like, Whoa. yeah, I like what, I like what you said there. That's kind of a, a case by case basis. Like remember when I was playing at Cal, we called it like getting our game face on and, the, but the game face was different for different people. Like for me, I need, before I, I'm headed out to competition, I need to be quieter. I need to just not, be relaxed, be relaxed, not have too many racing thoughts, but my teammate might need to be, you know, chatting or just kind of looking around or moving around. So, and it's, it, that works for her and that wouldn't work for me at all. But, yeah. but we both go out and we perform really well because we've tested those different things, like you said, and we found what works for us individually. And we've gone out and done that. And then we can both perform at our best, but it could be different for person A, B, and C it could be very different la mental landscape. So you want to find out what that game face looks like for you is what you're saying. And um, that could, you got to just kind of test, test your way through it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Or hire someone like me who can help you sort of weed through uh, how to put that together. And then again, sort of make that so that it becomes more automatic and second nature. Definitely, definitely. Awesome, great. Um, unless you have something to add, Drew, I'd like to just shift, shift to the next question so we can get, get through them. Yeah, so, to wrap it up, what <laughs> works for, you know, find something that works for you. That's, that's what I got yeah. out of it. You gotta yep. figure out what it is. And the, the nice thing is when you find something that works for you, it feels like you have control. And that's gonna be a really nice feeling because when you're in that situation, you feel like everything's getting out of control. So that's that's a great point. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Drew, awesome. what do you do before you play? Uh, before I play, mm, well, I got to get in a good warm up, and I and I nowadays I try to basically compete um, against another team or another you know from 
usually playing doubles. So that that will usually get me in the in the best, I guess, state overall. Um, you can get some points in, get some like uh, not tournament points in before you head to your tournament match. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, like you gotta you gotta be ready to go. Otherwise, if the other team's ready to go, you know they'll it, it'll run away from you real quick. You know. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think a lot of people just warm up their shots, and they you got to warm up your like competitive engine too. So if you can find another team to play with for for like a few points before you go on, great. If you don't, then just play skinny singles against your partner. Like you yeah. want to warm up the competitive component as well. I think that's a great yeah. point. All right. Um, next, we have um, from Waters, not to be confused with Anna Lee Waters or Lee Waters, just first name Waters. <laughs> what is the best strategy to identify your opponent's weaknesses in tournament play? So maybe you don't know them beforehand and you need to suss them out pretty quick. Like, what, what would you do? Drew, let's go with Drew. Well, unfortunately, one thing I don't like about pickleball warm-ups is that you warm up with your partner. So I have to look at my partner to warm up. Where in tennis, we would warm up against our opponents. And so you'd be able to hit certain shots to your opponents because you're warming up against them and kind of feel out your opponent while you're warming up. So that's a different thing, at least for me, to try to find out my opponent's weaknesses because I can't really look at my opponents if, if we're warming up because I'm not hitting against them. So what I do now is I, I the warm up when I get into a match isn't really f for me to warm up anymore. It's for me to just look over at my opponents and see what they what they look like, you know, if, especially if I don't know them. So yeah, I'll warm up a little bit, but really I'm looking over, trying to figure out like, you know, do they have good drives? Do they drive well off their forehand, you know, better than their backhand? How does it look like when they're dinking? You know, you know what, what does their mobility look like? Um, things like that. You know, if I can watch them play before, that, that's, you know, gonna tell me a lot. I'll see their style of play, you know, what they do, switching, stuff like that. Um, and then if I don't get to do any of that, I got, you got to figure it out during the game pretty quick. Um, some people play the backcourt better. Some people, you know, play up at the kitchen better. Some are weaker. So we got to figure that out pretty fast because the, the games move fast. So those are some of the things that, that I do. Um, and I would say there are differences if you're a tennis player coming into it. It's a little bit different, so. Gotcha. All right, let's uh, head to the next question from David. My partner and I seem to be slow starters, always playing worse at the beginning of the day, even after a pretty good warm-up period. We often lose to a team in the first game that we come back and beat fairly easily, easily later. What advice is there to improve this pattern? Michelle? Yeah. yeah. That really goes back to what I was saying uh, a few minutes ago about making sure you're in the right headspace when you start off. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always say if you, you know, if you start off slow or if you come out and you start off losing, then usually that means, you know, you're not feeling quite confident or you're feeling a little nervous and anxious. And again, what can be really helpful is to figure out like how you need to, you know, enter that very first game so that you can start off feeling ready to go. Uh, you know, even a physical warm up sometimes, most times is not going to get your head in the right headspace. Right. So again, we, you know, as human beings, we generally think, you know, if I warm up a lot, if I play like really competitive people beforehand, um, you know, I'm going to be ready to go. But again, oftentimes when I, you know, when I work with pickleball players, uh, they'll say, yeah, you know, I do all of these things to get ready to go, but my head still wants to do completely the opposite of what my body is doing. So it goes back to just making sure that, you know, if you need to be more energized, that you figure out what you need to do to get yourself more energized beforehand. Is that listening to 
some rap music or pop music or uh, yeah, we just have to figure out how to produce that energy. You know, tired is kind of a funny thing. Uh, a lot of my clients will say, you know, I'm feeling really tired before I'm going to play. And when I ask them, you know, is that a physical thing or a mental thing? They'll say, oh, no, no that's a mental thing. So, and it really is, because again, like these two pieces of our body are, you know, totally connected. So they all, all day long, regardless of what's going on, are impacting each other. Yep. Yeah. Great stuff. I think, yeah, a lot of what we covered in the first question applies here, just like you said. Um, I apologize. The, the chat got a little bit taken over by a bot, um, putting some inappropriate <laughs> messages in there. I think I've cut it off. I guess that means we're really popular, which is awesome that they even, that they found the live stream. Anyway, yeah. I think I have it under control. So I apologize for that. If you do see any, see any inappropriate stuff, that's not me. And I'll try to obviously cut it off as quickly as I can. Um, all right. Next question. Uh, again, from the emails, and I'll get to the chat questions here as soon as possible. I definitely haven't forgotten about you guys. I'm a three uh, from Barbara. I'm a 3.25 player overall, and I haven't been able to self-correct my mistake lately. I've been inconsistent and making tons of unforced errors. In order to reset myself while I'm playing on the court, I assume from making all these unforced errors all of a sudden, what should be on my checklist to help get me out of that? Um, anybody want to volunteer for that one? I could assign it. <laughs> let's go. Let's go, Drew. We'll go back and forth. Drew, Drew's up, and Michelle so, can tag on the like, back. It sounds like this person's trying to correct mistakes that they all of a sudden they're on the court. I think they're making a lot of unforced errors, and they're not yeah. able to come out of that. Is what I'm understanding. <clears throat> That's not fun. No, it's not. We've all been there. We're all going to yeah. be there again. <laughs> um, but it also sounds like they're trying to work on some aspect of their game. Is that true? Um, I'm not 100% sure. Let's just let's just go with, I think, what what I put out there. Because I it's a little bit, the question is not totally clear to me. But I think yeah. that's what I came across, is that all of a sudden, I'm there. I, I, I think the mental piece definitely comes into play. you got to figure out, like, what it is that's causing that. And I mean, I, I, it could be a number of things and there could be a number of solutions. Um, I think from that answer, I'll kick it over to Michelle. <laughs> I'll jump in here real quick and then I'll, I'll obviously kick it over to Michelle. She's the best one to answer, I think. So whenever I found myself in this situation, if you're just like you're going like I'm trying to go for my cross court or my down the line or wherever I have a really specific target and you know at a high skill level you should have a very very small target and I'm just not making it like they're just all going like not not quite where I want so that was just exactly what you're talking about so I, I attribute it to a little bit like okay I haven't found my range let me find my range so I'll just all of a sudden I'll just start hitting a lot right through the middle I'll go for the easiest possible shot middle of the box cross court, middle return. Like I'll just give myself huge margins for error and then I'll like try to sharpen it up. And then when I'm hitting like perfectly true middle, okay, like now I've found my range, then I'll start going for my, I'll start, start deploying my strategy again and going for like smaller targets. That's what I tend to do. I'd love to hear what Michelle has to say. So Nicole, that's one of the things actually that I was going to bring up is like, it's important to like, just, you know, not go big or go home, but just like, you know, take the shots, you know, you can make. Right. Um, I think a couple of other things when we make a mistake, our ego kicks in and it's like, oh, why did you do that? What is wrong with you? And then we get in our head. Mm -hmm. And when you're in your head, this is what I call multitasking, right? You're trying to play pickleball, but you're in your head. And it is multitasking because you can't be doing both things at the same time. And what's going to happen is you're going to get sucked up into whatever's going on in your head. So the game is still going on, but you're in your head. So you might be able to play, but you're sort of on autopilot. And then guess what? That then creates the next mistake and the next mistake, right? So that's 
those are two things, what you said and then that. And the third thing is making sure you have a really solid between point routine, right? Like reset, let that go or let that go, reset, let that go, reset. And every time between points, you got to learn not to hang on to those mistakes or those unforced errors. You really have to learn to train yourself. I can't do anything about that right now. I have to move on because the game is still going on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm, I can jump on board here. I mean, just from my experience, you know, it's like, what, what's the one thing that I think that is causing it? You know, what's the, what's like the main thing that I think is causing it? I mean, when I start making errors personally, you know, sometimes it's like I'm driving balls long in the net or I'm trying to do a third shot drop. I see this a lot. People do third shot drops and they're like all going in the net and they're like, Oh my God, like, you know, what's going on? So sometimes I think, <clears throat> um, you know, are you doing, the, am I doing the same thing? Do I just need to change my strategy and my shot selection? Um, have I assessed the environment? Is the wind, is the wind blowing, you know, a lot more one way than, than the other. And, that, and I just didn't assess it really. And I needed to make an adjustment, hit the ball harder into the wind this way, you know? So it's just kind of like, have I made so many errors now that I'm totally freaked out and now I need to use some sort of mental skill just to relax so I, I can think about strategy. So I th personally, I think there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of different, uh, different things. Um, but I think it's like, what's one thing that I can do that's going to probably help me get back to finding my rhythm you know, you lose your rhythm and feeling like, man, I, okay, I got my rhythm back. I, I can hit this. Sh okay, yeah, great. I made that third shot drop. Finally. Okay, we're good. You know, those that's the feeling I'm trying to get to uh, as a player. And I think a lot of players want to get back to that, that good feeling again. So, yeah, good stuff. I think that was really good can stuff. Call? Absolutely. I also think that we don't, I don't, I'm just going to speak for myself, drill and practice enough. Um, and I think that people also, there's a lot of people in that same boat that don't get to drill and practice enough. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, court time, yada, 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 people wanting to drill versus playing. But I think that one of the other things I work with clients on is like, you have to decide, right? You're going to go play this game today. Is it a social game? Is it a game where you're going to work on something? What type of play is this going to be for you today? Right. And if you're going to go and sort of work on something, then you have to recognize like, you know, that's what I'm doing today and I may or may not win. Right. So, but I think choosing, choosing and deciding like what, what going out and playing means for you, I think is also important because, you know, and I'm, again, I'm going to speak for myself. Like I play, play, play. Right. And then I expect things to change or, you know, I get pissed because like, you know, I'm making all these like, you know, inconsistent unforced errors. Um, but I haven't chosen to like drill or practice. So then they're, you know, now when I go and play, I think about like, okay, what's, what's my goal today? Is my goal to just go have fun? Is my goal to win? Is my goal to work on something? Mm -hmm. So I think that's also like critically important. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Great stuff. Great stuff. All right. I want to keep it moving. Really awesome. Love it. Um, okay. Uh, last email question. Then I'm going to jump to the chat questions. Um, I'm going to reframe this a bit, but the original question is, what do you, what do you do if you feel you're out of your league because nothing is going your way? How do you keep your head up when things aren't clicking? Okay. So I really think we covered that, um, pretty well already, but I'm going to tweak the question a bit because this is a, a different question is what do you do? Cause she says out of your league and you can be kind of outmatched in, um, in competition. Like you come up against a team and like, wow, like it's just clear that skill wise, 
they're a notch or two above you and the chances of you coming away with a W are slim. What can you do to get the most out of that to help you going forward? Uh, let's go with Michelle. Have to learn how to just be focused on, you know, yourself and your game and, you know, you and your partner working on whatever it is that you, you know, that you need to work on on court. I think a lot of times when we're playing people that are better than we are, we get sort of wrapped up and caught up in like their game and what they're doing. And we also get caught up in this thinking of like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to win. Um, and so I think part of it is, uh, you know, I think always part of it is going out and playing your best. And really that, that is you focusing on you and what you're doing. Um, and again, trying to stay out of that headspace and continuing to like reset and let go of things that are happening on court. So as I mentioned a little bit ago, making sure that you have that whatever between points is going to help you to let go of what just happened and then get ready for the next point. Good. Anything to add, Drew? Yeah, I would say, like, nice job, you know, stepping up and uh, exposing yourself to getting your butt kicked because it's it's tough because it's just going to it's just going to show you how good you are, you know, how good you aren't. Um, and from my experience, it's worth it. You know, you're going to become a better player, most likely. Um, you're going to see better shots. Uh, and if you're, if, if those players are that much higher than you, yeah, you're probably not going to win, but as long as you can get your ego out of there and see how this is going to help you develop your game and, and become a better player, you know, you're going to, you're going to notice how it does make you a better player, you know, five days from that match, a week, a week down, you know, from that match. And, and then you'll realize like, oh, wow, that was, I'm glad I did that. Um. So, yeah. And walking away with like, what did I learn from that? I think it's not so important. So I think Drew, you're sort of alluding to that a little bit, but. Yeah, totally. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the way to go. Like kind of, if you could, if you could see it as, as a gift, like, okay, wow, I'm really going to get to see um, what, like what I'm up, what I'm about here. And they're going to expose my weaknesses and it'll be clear that, okay, that's what I need to go work on and trying to just not try to like, all of a sudden go for stuff that's way out of your range like play your game play within yourself like bring the skills you have to the table and and see what happens it could be you had a great really solid game you pushed them and you came away with a loss of like 11 7. and you can feel great about that if you brought your best game to the table so not only would you walk away feeling good you also know like okay what prevented you from maybe winning that and then you can go back and use that as a stepping stone forward I know I see because I'm I'm on these forums like Pickleball Forum and all the other forums that are on Facebook and such and a lot of the questions that come up is like how do I get better players to play against me? Well, here's your chance. Go sign up for a tournament, and if you can set your ego aside and just like take the feedback, then that's a win. And a lot of people like don't put themselves out there like that. So do that. I commend you and I encourage you to do it because you're really going to come away if you approach it correctly, like see it as a gift, take this, um, take the lessons, go work on get better and come back again and do it all over again, man, you're just going to like, whoop, your improvements going to be happening a lot faster. Good stuff. All right, let's pivot to the next question. I'm going to read through the chat. So we may have covered your question. So if, if that's the case, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, any suggestions about how to anticipate and track opponents' shots coming to us from Lawrence? Drew, how about you take that one? Yeah, I, I use a mental technique, mental skill. Basically, and the way it'll be told to you and what you've probably already heard is try to read your opponent's paddle face. Basically, if, if you can just look at your opponent's paddle and where it's angled, it'll tell you where the ball is going to go. So for me as a player and as a coach, that's a skill that I use and I suggest other people use. 
And what we call it in the sports psych world is an external narrow focus. Um, you're looking at a narrow, through a narrow lens and that what you're looking at is your opponent's paddle, paddle face. So that'll help you anticipate um, in one way. Awesome. Um, let's, uh, okay, I'll add something to that. Um, exactly what Drew said. And then also you can add on seeing how they're coming into the shot. Like if you see they're coming high to low, that's probably going to be a slice. If you see they're coming low to high into the shot, that's probably, probably going to have some top spin on it. So in addition to what the paddle face angle ultimately ends up being at contact, you can read a lot from how they're coming into the, to the shot. Um, yeah, the, their body language. Yeah. <clears throat> if someone looks like they're about to, you know, rope the ball, am I ready to, am I ready to, you know, counter that or respond to that? When you say rope, you mean like big backswing looking like they're going to crush it? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like I see it coming, but am I actually ready? You know, yeah. is, is my energy, you know, appropriately dispersed? so to speak, throughout my body? Am I, am I ready for that? Yes. It's good to recognize it, um, but I also have to be, you know, position myself accordingly. Yeah. So once you recognize it, that's great. And then this, the next question is, is, you know, did I react appropriately to it? And then once you have those things kind of flowing together, it'll become second nature. That's what I find. The game will start to become, you know, more second nature, and then you'll hit shots like, wow, like I, that just happened, you know, naturally. <clears throat> but you're doing those, you're doing those things. Good stuff. That's what I got. All right. Anything, <laughs> Michelle, anything, or you want to move, we can move on as well? Yeah, I just think court positioning is huge too, right? Like really practicing, like when you see, like when you're watching the panel and you're seeing like, you know, body language on the other side of the net, I think it's really important just to make sure you're in the right position, right? If someone, yeah. So I think court positioning is huge. Yeah. yeah. Another thing you can do is also read patterns. Like if, like if you sent them this type of shot before and they've done the same thing every time, well, then that's how you anticipate like reading um what's what that player's tendencies are and that will certainly help with your anticipation it's like they're telling you what their playbook is you just have to be paying attention um okay we may have we may have covered this but in case we have anything to add um julie asks the question when things are going sideways in a match my husband tells me to watch the ball and breathe i think that's great advice what do you recommend to quickly reboot and get back in the game Feel like we've probably covered that, but if there's something, yeah, I think I think we'll move on. We've covered that. Um, <clears throat> this is a question for Michelle. How how do I overcome frustration and maintain positive attitude when teamed up with a weak player who is receiving majority of the shots and unable to make winning shots or get or or really even get the balls back consistently? Find another partner. No, kidding. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, again, I think it goes back to, you know, focusing on yourself and your shots, right? And you can't control what your partner is going to do. So if you're going to partner with someone who is a weaker player, then you just have to realize, like, that's what that's where you're at, right? And you can't do anything about that. That's out of your control. So the only thing that you really have control over when you're playing is yourself, right? Like your attitude frustration level and how you play um and yeah frustration is common uh you know especially when we're trying to take control of something that's outside of our control right so it's really practicing recognizing that frustration and sure deep breath works like recognizing the frustration taking a deep breath resetting and then moving forward um a lot of my players also have um, what I call uh, the one thing that they focus on, 
during, you know, any game. So always, you know, bringing your focus back to one thing. Like today I want to work on like this serve. Okay. Well, that's your sole focus today, right? Like everything else is just muscle memory. And then, you know, you're going to always bring yourself back to like, here's my focus today. Uh, but the most important thing is just recognizing the things that are outside your control because those are the worst things to get in your head and just create like angst and frustration. And why I always say when something's out of your control, all you can do is let that go. Yeah. Anything, anything you want to add there, Drew? No, I think that's great. That's it. That's it. Or right. um, Yeah. So just, that, that's a question that comes up a lot and it's a really tough one. And it just also depends on the context. I think like if you're in a, group drilling session and you're paired with a weaker player for a small fixed period of time, then just, you know, just go with it, encourage them. And like Michelle says, you feel good. You don't, you don't miss anything. Like you make sure you're working on your stuff and that you nail it. And then, you know, you're improving and maybe you can, you know, throw them some pointers. If it's someone, you know, and you think they'd be receptive to like, Hey, do you think I, you know, we could maybe I could, could take over a little bit more of, of the middle balls? Like how does, does that feel okay for you? You know, like some, some stuff like that, but you are you you are going to be dealing with the fact that they're going to be missing shots. There's just there's just no way around that um, because that's that's the, the scenario that you're in. All right. Um, Robert asks, which I think we've covered. How do we reset the nerves in competition like we reset the ball when we are in trouble during a point? I think we've pretty much covered that. Um, I can't pronounce this name so it might just be a screen name so I'm not even going to try um how can I help a partner who is very streaky gets hot and plays well or gets cold and starts making a lot of unforced errors solid question Michelle you want to jump in on that one first sure yeah well yeah and remember like you know your partner is you know you don't have any control over your partner although when you work together with partners right like you do have to figure out, especially if it's someone you're playing with on a consistent basis, you do have to work on communication and, you know, is there a way I can help support you? Like, what do you need in these moments? And um, so communicating that and then, uh, you know, doing, doing that, right? So many times, you know, we're playing with partners and we just, uh, you know, we try to give what we think is like really kind, nice, like, you know, whatever feedback and the other person just can't hear it or can't receive it because that's not what they want. That's not what they need. So it's really helpful to like communicate and check in with your partner and find out, you know, when these moments happen, what do you need from me? If anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. Great stuff. <clears throat> Drew, how do you, what do you do when you're partner, partner's hot and cold? Yeah. That's usually you. <laughs> that's usually you're, you're the streaky guy. No. I don't think so. I didn't think, I didn't think so either. I, I don't think I'm the streaky guy. I don't know. Sh streakiness is an interesting word, period. But it's it's so – we see it a lot, right? So a couple of things that come to mind are <clears throat> somebody's playing really well, then they start going for, you know, riskier shots and because they're – Maybe, maybe it's you, maybe it's your partner. You start to go for riskier shots because for like maybe five, six points, you've been playing out of your mind, right? So you get super confident and then you're like, oh, I can do anything. I can hit a third shot, drive down the line <clears throat> for a winner with my backhand, you know? And oh, you missed once, who cares? I'm still on fire. And then you start missing more shots and now we're in the streakiness, you know? So <clears throat> I think when that happens, I, I've, the thing that I've been working on has been, is, is communication with my partner. So I, I really, you know, agree with that. <clears throat> Someone's hopefully my partner will tell me like, Hey Drew, stop doing that. You know, we need to get back to, cut and dry pickleball strategy, you know, or, Hey Drew, you're going for too much. You know, why don't we just, 
you know, hit safer shots or just more text, you know, play more textbook. Um, <clears throat> I think the that that kind of streakiness scenario plays out a lot. Um, and really just going kind of back to the basics and communicating with each other, like letting each other know, like, hey, this is happening, you know, and doing it sooner rather than later is, is going to be helpful. Um, yeah. yeah, that's, that's what I got on that one. Take a yeah. time out too. If, if you yeah, know. time out, try <laughs> it out. And I think it's important to like read the room. And when I say read the room, like read your partner, because like, let's say Drew and I played together. Like Drew and I are like, we, we've played a ton of tennis, high level tennis. Like I can be direct with him. I can tell him like, Hey Drew, like what, you know, let's figure this out. You got to tone it down. You got to do this to that. And he'll take it well. And he can tell me the same thing, just very direct and dry and like straight to the point. And I'll take it fine because I'm used to that because I, I respect what he's going to tell me and vice versa. Like I know he means well, I know he wants us to just like perform well, but you have to <laughs> be mindful of who you're talking to that that my person might not know you so well, or might not hundred percent under like get all of this quite yet. So I think in, in, in that case, you might want to approach it with a, a gentler touch, like, like Michelle was, was suggesting there. So in both, in both cases, you want to address it, but lead with the, lead with the gentler touch, <laughs> unless you're sure, like I'd be sure with Drew that I could, and Michelle, that I could just be like, come on, like you got to go for something a little less risky or something, you know, like they're no, I'm not yeah. coming down on them. It's just like, let's, let's figure this out. One of my partners I play with, we talk about, okay, the wheels are coming off the bus. We need to put them back on. What do we need to do? So, yeah, I mean, it just, just depends on who you're playing with. Yeah. Good stuff. There's always a solution. Just have to figure it out. All right. I think that kind of is all the questions we have so for now. But if you have any anything else, please drop it in. But what I'd like to do now um, is, like, we've really just covered, you know, the tip of the iceberg stuff. Um, there's really kind of a systematic, more systematic way to approach all this and build your mental resiliency and mindset. And I wanted uh, to, Drew and Michelle to share about um, a, a camp that they have upcoming here alongside a tournament so you can get yourself super <laughs> mentally ready for the tournament. And then you go play the tournament and you put all your new skills to the test. So um, whoever can, wants to take that away, maybe Drew, why don't, you, why don't you start off and share the dates and details about the tournament as well as the sports site camp that you guys have coming up in August. Sure. So yeah, it's kind of a first of its kind set up and uh, Michelle and I are collabing on it. I didn't mention to, I didn't mention, but I have a master's in sports psychology and uh, Dr. Michelle was one of my professors. Oh, is that right? Okay, cool. Yeah. I did not know yeah. that. So that's how we know each other. And then we ran into each other on the pickleball court and started talking, you know, me as a coach and a tournament director and stuff like that. So it was kind of like, okay, yeah, we should, we should do a sports site camp. <clears throat> so we've been working on this camp together, uh, you know, putting together the format and what we're going to do is a one day sports site camp uh, the day before the tournament starts. It's August 25th. It's at Willow Pass Community Park. Um, Where? What city? Because we have people from all over. What's that? What city and state? Because we have people. Uh, Concord, from California, the best city in California. Okay. Concord, California at Willow Pass Community Park. Um, yeah, and then the tournament is the it's a three day tournament. Um, it's uh, the August 26th to the 28th at the same location. Um, so I think that kind of, I'll, I'll let Michelle kind of tell you more about, you know, what's in the camp. Um, how about that? Great. Yeah. So I'll, I'll have some questions for you about the tournament, but let's have Michelle um, tell us about the sports site camp. And that is immediately preceding the tournament, correct? And it's three days. Is that right? Yep. Camp, I'm sorry. Yeah, the tournament is three days, and the camp is a one day camp. One day camp for the sports site. Okay. Um, you wanted to share a little bit more about the sports site camp, Michelle? 
Sure. Uh, I have a system. It's called Feeding the Demons, and it's uh, largely we've largely talked about much of it uh, during during today. But it's really going to help players to develop or think about and understand again all the important moments in and around like pickleball and uh, tournament play specifically. Um, you know how you show up, how you warm up mentally, um, and you know helping them to figure out how to get in the right headspace, uh, how to deal with mistakes. Uh, we're going to talk about confidence and communication and working with partners and uh, just really how to think about competition and pickleball. Um, so not only develop the skills, but really think about, you know, sports is a tough, it's a tough thing for people. Competition is a tough thing for people. Like they want to do it, but then we get in it and it's like, uh, yeah, I don't really, I mean, you know, there's no handbook for it, right. From a mental perspective. So really walking people through the before, the during and the after and helping them to understand it and develop the tools they need for dealing with all of the like sort of ups and downs. So we're going to do some classroom stuff and then have them utilize that stuff and play a little bit and then go back to the classroom. So it's going to be a really good mix of uh, theory and application and theory and application throughout the whole day. It's going to be rock solid. Awesome. Awesome. And I, um, I've dropped all the, the links for the sports side camp, as well as the tournament, as well as how to connect with Drew and Dr. Michelle in the description of this video. It's on the chat because I can't paste links there. And when I'm looking at it, I'm not logged in as prime time. So it's in the description. All the links are there to, um, if you are wanting to check that out. And Drew, I have some questions for you about the tournament. So it's mm -hmm. it's a round robin, correct? And it's got prize money, is that right? Yeah, it does. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a prize money tournament. We have singles uh, and doubles. Um, if you like playing singles, that's a whole different world, um, as you know. Uh, or if you're gonna try to play singles for the first time, uh, but we have doubles, we have men's, women's, mixed, 19 plus, and 50 plus from the 3-0 to the uh, open level range. There's a lot of really good players. Um, we've got some good signups right now. And this is our second tournament uh, this year. The first one went, went really well. Um, we're hoping to build on that and make this event even better. I uh, would love to have you... Um, you know, come out to Concord, California. If you're not from the area and you're looking for a place to stay, if you go to the tournament website, we've got discounts on lodging. Um, you, you can get some, you can get a free $50 stay and play package. Uh, you can check that out. Anyways, it should be a, a lot of fun um, and hope to see you there. Awesome, awesome. And just one one last thing with the tournament. So it's not a sanctioned event, which just means it's not USA pickleball sanctioned. Which, so you mm -hmm. won't get that rating, like the two five. It won't impact that rating, but it will go into Duper, which is the I think a, a really excellent up and coming rating system that ultimately mm -hmm. I think will will take over because it's much more accurate, much more transparent. Just like we have a in tennis, UTR took over the like the USTA pickleball ratings, I really think Duper is poised to do the same. Um, and so although it is not um, sanctioned, it is the results are going to go into Duper, which it, I would argue is extremely valuable, possibly more valuable um, in the long run. Um, yeah, okay. your matches, yeah, basically your matches are going to count and they go on record um, into Duper. And it's it, it 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 will probably be the number one rating system, is my guess. So yeah, so I think super, <laughs> super duper. duper. Yeah, I think that's actually their that's part of their slogan. I've heard I heard the CEO throw that around. Super duper. I think it stands for a dynamic, universal pickleball rating. Um, great. Uh, this was awesome. Um, is there any final thoughts that either Michelle or Drew you'd like to add before we? 
we sign off? Uh, I just want to say thanks for having me on, Nicole and Drew. It's, you know, it's always a pleasure. Um, I do have a free 30 minute consult. So if anyone is interested in um, signing up for that, you can always email me directly or go to my website and there's a page there. And I also have a course. It's called uh, Beating the Fear, www.beatingthefear.com. Um, that just came out uh, a couple of months ago and it's a good base baseliner for information. Fantastic. So that's the direct link for the course. And then your overall general website is drmichelleclear.com, correct? Yeah. Yep. Great. And as I said, that's all linked to in the description below. So you don't have to worry. <laughs> for those watching that want to check that out, don't have to write it down. It's all there. Um, Drew, anything you want to add? Uh, no, just, uh, just know that, well, I guess I do have something to say. So okay. yeah. I would like to add that even if you, you know, live on the East coast and you want to connect with Dr. Michelle, you know, there's this thing that we're doing right now, you know, so you don't have to be meeting with her in person. If you do want, if you do need some, uh, help per se, or, you know, you just want to get mentally stronger. So you can meet with her online um, and, and use that to your advantage. She is the best of all time. And I just got to throw that, throw that your way. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. We're having a love fest. <laughs> so yeah. sweet. Yeah. That's awesome. That's and if you're local, we hope to see you at the camp. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Drew, uh, Drew's, all, you know, also got lots going on. He's a little more like locally based. He's got the tournament. He, I think of a cruise that people can participate in. Um, so yeah, you can go to my website, paragonpickleball.club. Check out all the stuff we got going on there. If you do go on Duper and, and you know, eventually I'm going to, we'll have the Paragon Pickleball Club on Duper. You can join it. Um, just add your name. You can join any Duper club. Um, but hopefully, you know, you'd want to join ours. Uh, and that's all I got. No more, no more plugs for me. <laughs> yeah. And you know, uh, Drew, I've taken a group, um, clinic with Drew and, uh, he's a really great coach too. So let the love fast continue. <laughs> uh, it goes, it goes two ways. Uh, Drew is a really awesome coach. So. Yeah, and Primetime Pickleball is the best YouTube pickleball channel of all time. Oh, so. that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Great stuff. Thank you so much. I Thanks for that. And I super appreciate you guys coming on. Um, really, really good answers. Honor you both. I can't wait to see you again when I'm back in California. A huge thanks for coming on and sharing all this um, this great stuff with us. I did see a few additional questions come through. I'm going to answer those in the um, in the comments below. So because we're going to wrap it up now, but thanks. I saw one or two more, so I will I will answer that. Um, yep. Yeah, thanks for everyone for watching, uh, for tuning in. Check out Michelle and Drew, and of course, primetime pickleball videos as they roll out and whatever. I've already got there. People seem to really like that. So <laughs> I'm super, always super happy to hear that I've been able to help someone. So awesome. Thank you. And uh, we're going to sign off. Have a great day and happy pickling. Happy fourth coming up.